I think it's important that people's theories of politics are built on a foundation of a theory about human nature or some rigorous empirics about human nature. And something that I think we do a bad job understanding is the way the psychology of identity and group affiliation function in politics. We tend to suggest that identity politics is something that only marginalized groups do, when in fact it's something we all do. All politics all the time is influenced by identity. In the 1930s and 40s, um, a guy named Henry Tajva was a Polish Jew moved from Poland to France. Uh, he moved from Poland to France because in Poland he couldn't go to university because he was Jewish. In France he enlists in World War II. He's captured by the Germans. But he's understood by the Germans as a French prisoner of war. So he survives the war. When he's released, all of his family has been killed in the Holocaust. And he would have been killed as well if they'd understood him to be a Polish Jew and not a French soldier. And he begins thinking and obsessing about these questions of identity. What makes human beings sort each other into groups? Why, when they sort each other into groups, do they become so easily hostile to one another? And what does it take to sort into a group? What are the minimum levels of connection we need to have with each other to understand ourselves as part of a group and not individuals? So he begins doing a set of experiments that are now known as the minimum viable group paradigm. And it's a bit of an ironic term for reasons that I will get to in a second. But he gets 64 kids from all the same school. And he brings them in and he says, you know, we need to do an experiment. Could you look at this screen and tell me how many dots are on it? Just real quick, do an estimation. And then they're like researchers busily scoring the work and deciding if the kids overestimated or underestimated. Then the researchers say, hey, while we've got you here, we need to do, do you mind doing another experiment with us, not related to the first one in any way? Um, we're just going to sort you into two groups, the people who overestimated the number of dots and the people who underestimated them. But the different experiment, don't worry about it. Um, in truth, this sorting is completely random. It has nothing to do with dots. Nobody cared how many dots anybody estimated. But immediately in this new experiment, which has to do with money allocation, the kids begin allocating more money, which they're not allocating to themselves, it's only to other people. They begin allocating more money to their co, dot, over, or under estimators. And this was a surprise because the way this experiment was supposed to work was Toshfell and his co-authors were going to sort people into groups, but not enough that they would begin to act like a group. And they were going to begin adding conditions to see at what point group identity took hold. But even Toshfell, who had gone, such a, gone through such a searing, traumatic, horrifying experience with how easily and how powerfully group identity takes hold, he underestimated it. He thought this would be underneath the line, almost like a control group. But it was already over the line. This experiment was replicated by him um, in other ways, and in other ways it actually showed not only would people favor members of their group, but they would actually discriminate against the out group. They would prefer that everybody gets less, so long as the difference between what their group and the other group got was larger. And again, these groups are meaningless and random even atop their meaninglessness. But look around. Think about sports. Think about how angry people get, how invested they get in their identity connection to a team that oftentimes has no loyalty back to them, that will move if it doesn't get a stadium tax break, or players who will leave if they get a better deal. But we get so invested in our local team and what it says about our identity and the group we're part of as fans of that team, that in the aftermath of losses and wins, we will riot, we will set things on fire, we will go on emotional roller coasters, we will cry, we will scream, we will listen endlessly to analysis of it. We're not there for the sportsmanship, we're there for the winning or losing. We're there for that connection to group psychology that is played out through sports and competition. This is true in politics as well, as we sort into groups, as those stakes rise, as they become in many cases life and death, as many different groups connect to one another. You're not just a Democrat, but you're a Democrat, and also you live in cities, and also you're gay, and also you're an atheist, and so on. Those things all begin to fuse together. It becomes what the political scientist Liliana Mason calls a mega identity. And when you're dealing with two groups that are that sharply distinguished from each other and where the stakes are very, very high, the power of that group identity and the power of the hostility to the other group becomes basically overwhelming. From a lot of different experiments, we know this is a much larger driver of political behavior than even policy. We will follow parties and leaders around to policies that we didn't believe them to have just recently. I mean, look at Republicans and Russia, for instance. But what we will not do is change our group affiliations, certainly not easily. So group identity is a fundamental fact about politics. And it's a fundamental fact not just of the politics of marginalized groups, but of majoritarian groups. Um, an irony of our age is that we see identity politics more clearly now, not because it is stronger, but because it is weaker. Um, there is no one identity group with the power to fully dominate politics. And so now that different groups are contesting, they're all putting forward claims, they're all fighting for control, we can see that there's identity in our politics. But there always was. 
Um, it's just that when one group is strong enough, they're able to make that identity almost invisible and just call it politics. Thank you.